when the world changed on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Whitney, like so many members of that greatest generation, and truly that's a label that is very well deserved, uh, parked all previous plans and enlisted in the Navy uh, in early 1942. He served in the Navy for the war years and toward the end of the European War was recruited from the Pacific Theater and brought across the world by the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, to serve in the European Theater. His assignment during that summer of 1945, after the, the peace had been won and the combat had, the, the combat had stopped, but the peace was very much still being won in Europe, was to gather evidence for the OSS process to assist the prosecution of war criminals. During that summer, Robert Jackson, appointed by President Truman, traveled to London and set up his initial operation to negotiate with the other three victorious allied powers, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, in London, a legal structure to try the captured Nazi leaders. Of course, the legal negotiation was only part of the project. It also is obviously necessary to have evidence and to figure out where the facts dictate the prosecution effort should go. And in a cooperative way that is a model for the way we would hope our intelligence community always can work, the OSS gathering of evidence process and the Jackson planning of trial process quickly came to merge and share resources. And really, a point of that sharing was in the person of Whitney R. Harris. Um, I think almost on a self-starting basis and on a very ad hoc basis, as he would find good stuff, he would take it uh, around the corner, not very far, to the office space where the Jackson operation was set up. And the Jackson operation was a very small staff and doing an enormously huge job at a breakneck speed and very quickly came to know, like, trust, and covet Whitney Harris. And in the, uh, the clout that a Supreme Court justice with the effective rank of a general has, uh, Jackson plucked Whitney Harris from the OSS and made him part of the Jackson operation. They moved from England to the continent, and after the indictment was returned, set up and prepared for trial in Nuremberg during that fall of 1945. Whitney Harris had a central role as a relatively young lawyer in preparing now the legal cases based on the evidence that he and many others had been part of gathering in those months in middle, late 1945. His particular aspects of the case preparation were the evidence against the Gestapo itself as an organization, the evidence against the security directorate of the Nazi regime itself as an organization, and the evidence against the individual defendant, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, who was the head of the Nazi security apparatus and incidentally and quite shockingly, a lawyer. In 1946, in January, uh, about six weeks into the trial, Whitney Harris, having been essential to the preparation of those cases, himself at that historic podium, presented to the tribunal the case against Kaltenbrunner. That was not the end of his trial work, for over the course of these months, he had come to be known and treasured by Robert Jackson as one of his principal assistants. And into the spring of 1946, Whitney worked with Justice Jackson on many of the tasks that were Jackson's own parts of the trial including his principal cross-examination in March of 1946 of Hermann Goering. Now, some of you may know that at the time and in history, that cross-examination has been somewhat criticized as insufficiently effective uh, as trial theater. I must say, as a scholar and a student of that work, um, both on paper in the trial transcript and also on videotape, uh, I think that examination has gotten a bum rap as trial theater. But what the commentators and the sort of hungry media superficial perspective uh, then, like now, uh, was looking for and missed in 1946 was the point, not only of that cross-examination, but of course of a real trial process. A real trial process is about bringing forward evidence and carrying a burden of proof and demonstrating to an independent tribunal that a defendant who has had sufficient and independent resources to defend himself is guilty of the crimes charged beyond a reasonable doubt. And the examination most powerfully did that. But in addition, what the examination did was provide to us 
into history an unimpeachable evidentiary record of the crimes of Goering and, of course, the apparatus he supervised as a number two official in the Nazi regime. You look at the photographs of Robert Jackson at the podium during that cross-examination, and some are tight shots, head and shoulders of Jackson. Some give you an only slightly larger vantage point on the trial process. And the person at Jackson's right hand physically and the person at Jackson's right hand in the operation, preparation, and conduct of that examination was Whitney R. Harris. Whitney Harris remained at Nuremberg through Jackson's summation in July of 1946, through the, the judgment that was returned the last day of September, yesterday, uh, in anniversary terms, 1946, and through the day that the sentences were handed down by the tribunal, which was today in anniversary terms, October 1, 1946, uh, 58 years ago. Justice Jackson uh, had returned for those events and then, of course, left Nuremberg again and returned to his life and distinguished accomplishments on the Supreme Court. Whitney Harris remained in Nuremberg and was part of the official representation of the American prosecution at the executions, which occurred on October 16, 1946, 11 hangings of those who had been sentenced to death. And then Whitney Harris continued to serve our country by remaining in Germany for additional years in the late 1940s, serving under General Lucius Clay, who was the principal military command authority over occupied Germany. Those were the momentous years of the Berlin blockade, and in response, the Berlin airlift, and really the start of the Cold War and the American response in the Truman administration through General Clay to those fundamental challenges, which continued to be our challenges, and ultimately were challenges that we met successfully over the next 40 years. Whitney Harris ultimately returned to the United States. He became a law professor at Southern Methodist University, and then uh, a career turn uh, I, I won't be making because I've got a project that will keep me in academia. Uh, he, in a sense, returned to serve the legal profession, which had been served so well by Jackson and Jackson's team as what they stood for in world eyes at Nuremberg. He went to work for the American Bar Association as its first executive director and was at the center of some of the major law reform and legal uh, profession projects that the ABA did. He ultimately settled in St. Louis, Missouri, which is his hometown today, became counsel to Southwestern Bell Telephone, and really one of the great private practice lawyers uh, in his region and in his generation in this country, which of course is what he was trying to do in Los Angeles in the late 1930s when the world's needs got in the way and he responded to the call. Now, Whitney Harris had a great admiration for his boss, Robert Jackson. There are many ways to capture it. His physical presence here today, of course, captures it. One nugget that I'd like to share with you, or just a portion of it, is a letter I found recently in the Library of Congress. This is a letter that Whitney Harris wrote to Irene Jackson, the widow of Robert Jackson, 50 years ago, uh, just a few days from now. All who were privileged to work with your husband held him in the highest esteem. His personal kindness caused him to have the affection of all who knew him. There was no man whom I held in greater admiration. Whitney Harris to Irene Jackson, October 1954. Whitney, Whitney Harris has spent much of his life uh, living and advancing the legacy of Nuremberg. And a piece of that has been his work and his generosity toward the Robert Jackson Center. He has been instrumental in endowing a Whitney R. Harris lectureship uh, and graces us with great honor today uh, as the first person to deliver that lecture. He's been here before. He was part of the round table of three Nuremberg prosecutors, Henry King, and Whitney Harris and Bernard Meltzer uh, three years ago, October 2001. And he gave a brilliant address that evening at the Chautauqua Institution's Athenaeum Hotel. Uh, at this point, of course, I'll note something that Whitney would note immediately if I led him to the microphone, which I'll do in a moment. Uh, no great class act, which Whitney Harris certainly is, is merely a solo operation. Whitney Harris has a teammate, uh, and Anna Harris was with him three years ago. Uh, they're coming up on their fifth wedding anniversary, she mentioned last night. Uh, and she's here. <laughs> now, Whitney Jackson, 
greatly admired and valued Whitney Harris. Uh, Robert Jackson, uh, 50 years gone, uh, an event we will mark this Sunday, uh, obviously was doing two things in his work at Nuremberg. He was performing the task of 1945-1946, bringing law and a fair, just, due process model of law to the wreckage of Europe and bringing legal accountability in the wake of that war by trying and convicting the criminals who had perpetrated that war, that criminal war. Uh, but it wasn't a one-year job. It wasn't even a 1940s, 1950s Jackson life period job. It was a task he was performing for history. Because of course, at the level of what really matters, that's what law is. Law is an effort to advance the order of our civilization. And Robert Jackson talked about how Nuremberg would come to have a meaning, a meaning he wasn't quite sure he could exactly predict, in the century run. In a hundred years, we'll know what Nuremberg really amounted to. Between Nuremberg and that hundred year point, there will simply be more tasks and more efforts to live up to it and build on it or to slip back and fall short of it. And part of what Robert Jackson left behind when his life ended much too quickly was not only the legacy of his work, but some of the brilliant assistants and colleagues who were part of that work. And I'm certain to the core of myself uh, that no one would be happier, not only with Whitney Harris's presence today, but with Whitney Harris's work in this area over the last 50 years than Justice Robert Jackson. That's not just my assertion. The last writing that Justice Jackson did uh, of an official nature in late September 1954 was his preface to Whitney Harris's majestic book, Tyranny on Trial. In that preface, Jackson lauds Whitney and his work telling the comprehensive, definitive account of the evidence that was gathered at Nuremberg. And Jackson refers to Nuremberg as the most significant work of his life. Jackson was delighted with Whitney Harris as a Nuremberg colleague, with Whitney Harris as a Nuremberg scholar, with Whitney Harris as someone who would carry the torch forward um, in that area of that enormous legacy. And of course, that's what Whitney is here doing today. In addition to tyranny on trial, Whitney Harris has continued to write and speak in that area. And the last particular honor of this event is that it unveils Whitney's new book. The Tragedy of War, which is really a magnum opus, a synthetic grand address on the topic of war and war as a crime. War as something that armies, of course, fight and armies, of course, need to win, but that law can, in its most majestic aspirations, play a role in addressing, in responding to after the fact, and ideally even in preventing. It's a great honor to welcome back to the Jackson Center my friend, Whitney R. Harris. Jackson family who are here, honored judges, members of the bar, and ladies and gentlemen. When Euripides wrote the Trojan women in the fifth century BC, Athens was locked in a bitter 16-year-old struggle with Sparta, its rival city-state. Emotions concerning the justice of the war ran high on both sides. 
A year previously, Athens had launched a preemptive strike against Milos, an island friendly to Sparta, which wanted to remain neutral in the Peloponnesian War. The Athenians killed all the men and sold the women and children slaves. Troy was raised to the ground. It is against this background of crime and horror, of the suffering caused by war, that Euripides wrote, the Trojan women, perhaps the finest and most powerful anti-war play ever written. The play follows a small group of women as they wait to be sold into slavery or taken by force as concubines. Hecuba laments, O oh my country, O oh unhappy land, I weep for thee now left behind. O oh, what mourning and what sorrow, O oh, what endless stream of tears in our houses. The dead alone forget their griefs and never shed a tear. Its bitter denunciation of war makes us understand why this play, first performed at the festival of Dionysius held in 415 BC, remains dynamically profound today. How can it be that over 2,500 years after this tragedy, Man, who fancies himself to be intelligent, has still not found a solution to this tragedy, war and the aftermath of war. In 1934, President Franklin Roosevelt invited a Jamestown, New York attorney, Robert H. Jackson, to come to Washington as general counsel of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Jackson became an immediate favorite of the president, so much so that by 1939, he was considered by Roosevelt as a suitable candidate for the vice presidency of the United States. In 1940, President Roosevelt appointed Jackson attorney general of the United States. War broke out in Europe on September 1, 1939, with the German assault on Poland. England and France responded to their treaty commitments to Poland, but were unable to stem or even impede the German assault. And Stalin connived with Hitler to tear Poland apart and share the spoils. When Hitler turned to France, his victory was swift and complete. Only Great Britain opposed him in the West. England came under intensive German assault and her fleet and convoys were heavily attacked. Churchill did not hesitate to carry on the fight with Hitler alone, but he sought to replenish and augment <coughs> British military facilities which were sustaining alarming damage by the German military machine. The need for destroyers was desperate. They were essential to guard the convoys bringing war material to England, and the Germans were sinking them literally at the rate of one a day. The British ambassador to the United States, Lord Rothian, asked Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, for the destroyers of which Great Britain was in such desperate need. An agreement was worked out under which the United States provided destroyers to England in exchange for certain possessions of uh, uh, Great Britain in the Atlantic and Caribbean. It was this agreement which led to the Lend Lease Act of March 11, 1941. As Attorney General, Jackson gave his opinion to President Roosevelt that the consent of Congress was not required for this transaction. But it gave rise to the serious question whether such support to Great Britain in its war with Germany might be deemed to constitute an act of war by the United States against Germany, justifying German retaliation against the United States. Jackson stated that even if the transaction was considered to aid Great Britain in its struggle with Germany, 
it would not constitute a violation of international law by the United States, as he later wrote. At the time, the Hague conferences were held and most conventional international law was written. Each state was regarded as having the legal right to resort to war against any other state at any time for any reason or for no reason at all. Since all war making was a legal right, a third state that wished to claim the immunities of a neutral had to abstain from any forms of assistance to either of the equally lawful belligerents. But following the First World War, nearly all of the nations, including Germany, agreed unequivocally by the kellogg briand Treaty to forego war as an instrument of national policy. That treaty and many others that Germany had entered into left no vestige of legal right for her to resort to a war of aggression. From the beginning, Roosevelt, Hull, Wells, Stimson, and I had been in agreement that Hitler's war was one of naked aggression and that by contemporary international law it was an illegal one and that other powers were under no legal obligation to remain indifferent, but instead had the right, if not a duty, to vindicate the rule established under these treaties by assisting the victims of such unlawful aggression. It was upon this legal basis that Secretary Stimson and Secretary Hull espoused the Lendley's program before Congress. This concept of the Nazi attack on the peace of the world as an illegal enterprise was the fundamental assumption of the whole aid to England policy of the Roosevelt administration. Jackson was nominated by President Roosevelt as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court in 1941. The nomination was quickly confirmed and he was no longer an active advisor of the President in meeting the constant crises of World War II following the bombing of Pearl Harbor and America's entry into World War II, Jackson desired to serve his country more actively. The opportunity came as the war drew to a close with an Allied victory. Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson was to serve America as its chief prosecutor in the trial of the leading German war criminals of World War II. The genesis of this historic trial was the Moscow Conference of October 1943, at the conclusion of which a statement was signed by President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Premier Stalin, declaring the determination of the three powers to hold Germans individually responsible for crimes committed by them in the course of the war. At that time, Lord Chancellor Simon and Prime Minister Churchill were of the opinion that leading war criminals should be disposed of by executive action, a view echoed in the United States by Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau, who proposed to President Roosevelt that German arch criminals be shot upon capture and identification. Secretary Morgenthau was opposed in the cabinet by Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, who believed that leading Nazis should be brought to trial before an international military tribunal. Stimson's views ultimately prevailed, and a memorandum recommending a trial was prepared for the use of uh, President Roosevelt at the Crimea Conference in February 1945. The memorandum stated that condemnation of German war criminals after a trial would command maximum public support and receive the respect of history. And it noted that use of the judicial method would make an authentic and irrevocable record of Nazi crimes. If the American position were to be prevailed, it was necessary that a person of impeccable qualifications be designated to represent uh, the United States. 
Justice Jackson was appointed by President Harry Truman on May 2, 1945, as the United States Chief of Counsel, charged with obtaining the agreement of the Allies to a trial of the major German war criminals before an international military tribunal, and he entered upon this daunting task with unswerving determination. He succeeded in persuading the British to accept the proposal to punish leading German war criminals only after a fair and open trial. Representatives of the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union met in London on June 26, 1945 for the purpose of drafting an agreement for the trial of the Germans a charter for the tribunal, and an indictment of the principal leaders of Nazi Germany. Justice Jackson thought that the Allied representatives would quickly agree to the American plan, calling for a fair trial to determine the guilt or innocence of the accused, a general charge of conspiracy to seize control of the state, and subvert it to the criminal purposes of the conspirators, an accusation of waging aggressive war, and specific charges of war crimes against soldiers and humanitarian crimes against civilians. To his surprise, the American plan incurred opposition from other representatives. The question arose whether the initiating of aggressive war in general should be charged as criminal or whether the aggression count should be restricted to acts in violation of specific treaties, agreements, or assurances. The latter viewpoint had more the indicia of a contractual than a criminal violation. Obtaining a judicial declaration that the initiating and waging of a war of aggression was a crime in international law was to Justice Jackson an issue of such supreme importance that he would have foregone the trial rather than surrender this principle. Other representatives were less concerned since in most cases Hitler's aggressions had violated specific treaties, agreements, or assurances. Moreover, the charge against heads of state for waging aggressive war was unique in international law and to the French at least carried the opprobrium of ex post facto legislation. In opposing the inclusion of the charge of aggressive war, the French representative declared that the Americans want to win the trial on the ground that the Nazi war was illegal, and the French people and other people of the occupied territories just want to show that the Nazis were bandits. But Justice Jackson insisted that ex post facto or not, the issue of the criminality of heads of state who initiate wars of aggression should be adjudicated in the proceeding. His argument prevailed, and in the final draft of the Charter, the planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression was declared to be a crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. In his final address to the, to the Tribune, Justice Jackson recapitulated the Nazi preparations for the waging of wars of aggression. He declared that from the moment the Nazis seized power, they set about feverish but stealthy efforts in defiance of the Versailles Treaty to arm for war. And he detailed the massive steps taken in building the weapons for war which he declared were put to use in a series of undeclared wars against nations with which Germany had non-aggression treaties and in violation of repeated assurances of peaceful relations. On September 1, 1939, this rearmed Germany attacked Poland, he said. The following April witnessed the invasion and occupation of Denmark and Norway, and May saw the overrunning of Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Another spring found Yugoslavia and Greece under attack. And in June 1941 came the invasion of Soviet Russia. Then Japan, which Germany had embraced as a partner, struck without warning on December 7, 1941. And four days later, Germany declared war on the United States. He said, we need not trouble ourselves about the many abstract difficulties 
that can be conjured up about what constitutes aggression in doubtful cases by all the canons of plain sense. These were unlawful wars of aggression in breach of treaties and in violation of assurances. Upon the conclusion of the arguments of counsel, the case was submitted to the tribunal for its opinion, which was issued on October 1, uh, 1946, as John just said precisely, 58 years ago to this very day. On the issue of aggressive war, the tribunal declared the charges in the indictment that the defendants planned and waived aggressive war are charges of the utmost gravity. War is essentially an evil thing. Its consequences are not confined to the belligerent states alone, but affect the whole world. To initiate a war of aggression, therefore, is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime, differing only from other crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. The tribunal held that of the 22 defendants brought to trial before it, 12 were guilty of the crime of waging aggressive war. Rudolf Hess, successor designate to Hitler after German Goering, was convicted of this crime alone. On the afternoon of October 1, 1946, the International Military Tribunal convened in final session. Every chair in the courtroom was occupied, except the 21 chairs in the prisoner's dock. The four judges and their alternates sat at the bench. Defense counsel faced them across the room. To the left were the four tables of the prosecution staffs. I sat at the American prosecution table. Behind us, members of the press and guests packed the visitors' gallery. The defendants were to be brought into the courtroom one at a time to hear the sentences pronounced against them. At ten minutes before three, the panel door in the back of the prisoner's dock slid silently open. The defendant, Herman Goering, stepped out of the elevator which had brought him from the ground floor where the other defendants waited. Goering put on A, uh, the set of headphones which had been handed to him by one of the white helmeted American guards. The president of the tribunal began to speak. Gehring signaled that he was unable to hear it through the headphones and there was an awkward delay while the technician sought to correct the difficulty. A new set of headphones was produced and once again Gehring quietly awaited the words of which were to decide his fate. Defendant Herman Wilhelm Gehring, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. The number two Nazi turned on his heel and passed through the panel door to the elevator. The door closed and there was a hum of whispered voices in the courtroom as those present awaited the arrival of the next defendant, Rudolf Hess. Hess, who had flown his Messerschmitt to England in a futile effort to persuade the British to abandon the fight with Germany, was sentenced uh, to imprisonment for life. The other defendants appeared in turn and received uh, their sentences. Of the 12 convicted of the crime of waging aggressive war, seven were sentenced to die by hanging. I had been designated by Justice Jackson as his personal representative at the executions and was present in the Palace of Justice on the fateful night of October 15, 16, 1946. Shortly before midnight, the electrifying word was released 
how that Gehring had cheated the hangman by taking poison while lying ostensibly asleep upon a bed in his cell. Death thus came to Gehring by his own hand, as it had done to Hitler, Himmler, and Goebbels before him. Even as the prison officer was walking to the cell block to give formal notice of the executions uh, to take place that night. At 11 minutes past one o'clock in the morning of October 16, the white faced former foreign minister, Joaquin von Rebendrop, stepped through the door into the execution chamber and face the gallows on which he and the others condemned to die by the tribunal uh, were to be hanged uh, that night. His hands were unmanacled and bound behind him with a leather thong. Ribbentrop walked to the foot of the 13 steps leading to the gallows platform. He was asked to state his name and answered Joaquin von Ribbentrop. Flanked by two guards and followed by the chaplain, he slowly mounted the stairs. On the platform, he saw the hangman with a noose of 13 coils and hangman's assistant with a black hood. He stood upon the track and his feet were bound with a webbed army belt. Asked to state any last words, he said, God protect Germany. God have mercy on my soul. My last wish is that German unity be maintained that understanding between East and West be realized and there be peace for the world. The trap was sprung and Ribbentrop died at 1.29. In the same way, each of the remaining defendants approached the scaffold and met the fate of Count Brunner. Seven German leaders died in the prison of the Palace of Justice at Nuremberg in the early morning hours of August 16, 1946 for the crime of waging aggressive war. If Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler had not committed suicide, the number of leading Nazis executed for this crime would have been not less than nine. Were these too many to answer for waging the most widespread and destructive war in history? World War I had taken nine million lives. World War II, three times as many to willfully kill a single human being is a major crime under the laws of every nation. How many millions of human beings must die before the perpetrators of war are held accountable for the crime of waging aggressive war? The urgency of establishing legal controls over post-Hitler tyrants became apparent when on August 2, 1990, the Iraqi military forces under the orders of the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein attacked Kuwait with the declared objective of incorporating it as the 19th province of Iraq. The war of aggression waged by Saddam was repulsed <coughs> by a coalition led by the United States with the approval of the Security Council of the United Nations. But no criminal charges were brought against Saddam because an international criminal court was not then in existence and the world community of nations was unwilling to try him in absentia before an ad hoc tribunal as Martin Bormann had been tried at Nuremberg despite efforts of a committee of former Nuremberg prosecutors, which I organized in adopting a resolution published in the congressional record calling for his trial. Aggression was leaving the law behind.
the General Assembly had considered a proposal for an international criminal court when drafting the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, but failed to approve it. On the day it adopted the Genocide Convention, uh, December 18, 1948, however, the General Assembly requested the International Law Commission to undertake a study of a permanent international criminal court. In August 1951, a committee on international criminal jurisdiction composed of representatives of 17 member states submitted a draft statute to the General Assembly calling for the formation of a court to try persons accused of crimes under international law. Thus began a long period of international negotiations culminating in the General Assembly Resolution of December 17, 1996, calling for a diplomatic conference of plenipotentiaries to meet in 1998. The conference convened in Rome on June 15, 1998, under the chairmanship of Philip Kirsch of Canada. I was an NGO delegate representing the Committee of Former Nuremberg Prosecutors, of which I was the founder and coordinator. In opening, in opening the conference, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan declared, after the defeat of Nazism and fascism in 1945, the United Nations was set up in an effort to ensure that world war could never happen again. The victorious powers also set up international tribunals in Nuremberg and Tokyo to judge the leaders who had ordered and carried out the worst atrocities and they decided to prosecute the Nazi leaders not only for war crimes, waging wars, and massacring people in occupied territories, but also for crimes against humanity, which included the slaughter of their own fellow citizens and others in the tragedy we now know as the Holocaust. Was it enough to make an example of a few arch criminals in states that had waged aggressive war and leave it at that, the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, did not think so. On June 17, the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Bill Richardson, addressed the conference. He endorsed the inclusion of serious violations of international humanitarian law, genocide, large-scale war crimes, and crimes against humanity but declared it premature to attempt to define a crime of aggression for purposes of individual criminal responsibility. But this was after, and in spite of the fact that the Allied powers had found Nazi aggressors of World War II guilty of this crime and had assessed the penalty of death by hanging upon those convicted. Was this a contention that the leaders of Germany who had been hung at Nuremberg had been wrongly tried, convicted, and sentenced? Or an exculpation in advance of future leaders of the triumphant powers of World War II from trial for waging an aggressive war in the future, if that should happen? With virtually unprecedented speed, the statute for a permanent international criminal court gained and surpassed the 60 ratifications necessary for entry into force less than four years after the Rome Conference of 1998. The crime of waging aggressive war is not included in the body of crimes within its jurisdiction, but will be considered at the review of the statute in 1909, at a special ratification ceremony held on April 11, 2002 at the United Nations headquarters in New York City, 10 countries simultaneously deposited their measurements of the ratification. The tribunal came into being on July 1, 2002, an historic landmark in the enforcement of the rule of law and in international relations. Rome Treaty is the vision and 
product of the Western world, the world that gave America its life, its beliefs, and its conscience. Canada, our neighbor to the north, a like heritage, traditions, and principles, ratified the treaty on July 7, 2000. The United Kingdom, from which our legal system largely derives, ratified the treaty on October 4, 2001. And Germany, whose leaders stood trial at Nuremberg in the great trial which gave meaning to the crime of waging aggressive war, ratified the treaty on December 11, 2000 upon the unanimous vote of the Bundestag, which I was privileged to witness. Why has America, in this issue of law versus force, abandoned its traditional friends and allies and chosen the company of nations it has mistrusted in the past, such as Iran, Iraq, Russia, and China? Certainly it is not because it prefers the international policies of the latter states. It is rather that present American leadership believes that as the world's remaining superpower, the United States at this moment in history may serve its interests more effectively through a unilateral approach to the conflict resolution in international as one of his final acts of office, President Clinton directed Ambassador David Sheffer, our chief negotiator at the Rome Conference, to sign the treaty on behalf of the United States. President Bush purported to rescind that signature on May 2002. This had the effect of excluding the United States from any further contact with the proponents of the statute. It was an act of self-exclusion from one of the most significant instruments for international justice ever approved by the world community. The United States is no longer entitled, as would a signatory nation which had not yet ratified the treaty to participate in negotiations for improvements in the statute in the review conference of 2009. It was an act of futile defiance intended to show the world, friend and foe alike, that the United States intends to stand against the Rome statute for a permanent international criminal court. A signed treaty need not be submitted by the President to the Senate for ratification. The treaty declaring defining the crime of genocide was not approved by the Senate for over 40 years after its enactment. It is now effective international law. The United States, reluctant to sign the Rome Statute, fails in its mission to serve world peace by aligning itself with other non-signers and divorcing itself from its traditional friends and allies. In an address to the American Society of International Criminal Law, Justice Jackson offered this challenge. If aggression is so wrong that international law calls upon our youth to die in remote parts of the world to stop it, these innocents have, I submit, a moral right to ask, what will you do about those persons guilty of it? An effective system of, international, of justice in international relations must crown our municipal systems of law. Our scientists have not feared to make thermonuclear bombs which could destroy civilization. Certainly, we should not fear to establish the principles of law which will permit civilization to survive. We must have the courage to find the way to make law supreme in international affairs, or we shall live forever in a world of force under a pall of fear. 
as we all well know, in this hour of peril, at the beginning of the 21st century, mankind has yet to learn how to live in peace under law on planet Earth. The means and methods of war have become far more devastating and lethal than in any prior century. There is no turning back upon our destructive capabilities. The Hiroshima bomb of the 20th century becomes the hydrogen bomb of the 21st century, becomes the incredible bomb of the 22nd century, becomes the unimaginable bomb of the 23rd century, and so on until we can devastate Europe or America with a single missile attack. The Rome Statute was the climax of many actions, beginning with the drafting of the Charter of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg more than half a century before the conference. <coughs> but even 50 years is just a moment in mankind's search for security. Revision of the Rome Statute must be considered after a trial period of seven years. 700 years may pass before we are able to eliminate aggressive war and terrorism in the world and establish a system of universal justice. Rome was the beginning. The end may never come. For like Rome itself, the struggle for peace and justice in the world is eternal. The world in which we live is subject to the overwhelming fact of force. Nature speaks to us in that idiom. The hurricane that rises from the sea and spreads havoc on the land. The earthquake that shatters the stillness of the day and brings buildings tumbling to the ground. The erupting volcano that sends boiling lava over green fields and quiet homes are forces which nature may unleash in angry mood. Against these forces, mortals have yet to prove their greater power. No one has shown the way to still the voice of the mighty hurricane or quell the mysterious shifts of underlying mountains or stop the red lava in its flow to the sea. And yet these forces of devastation do not possess the power to destroy humankind, which human beings have themselves devised. The atomic age burst in fury upon the world. We are caught in the peril of that age. Man-made forces can now destroy man. Perhaps civilization is in its decline and barbarism its due. But that will depend upon whether force or law triumphs in tomorrow's world. Freedom and justice are the basic practices for a world at peace as for a nation of free men. Are they not likewise the spirit of the American dream? If we are true to that dream and manifest that spirit to the world, may we not go forward into this nuclear age confident that tyranny, terrorism, shall not extend their sway nor war become their gain. Placing our faith in the cause of justice, the freedom of man, and the mercy of God. If an H.G. Wells should write an outline of history some thousands of years from now, he would undoubtedly discuss prehistoric civilization in his first chapter. Succeeding chapters would then describe in a period of enduring peace the achievements which the free spirit of man can attain when his sole efforts are directed toward the search for truth and the betterment of life rather than toward his self-destruction through war. We have yet to close that second chapter of the history of the world, and mankind was never in greater peril. The lance is now a missile. The arrow is a rocket, 
and the cannon has become a nuclear bomb. Caesar's legions conquered primitive tribes. Today's armies can destroy the world. It is in this context that the Rome Conference of 1998 assumed such great significance. It brought international law, its precepts and principles to a new standard of enforceability and gave not only the hope but the promise of a future world in which criminal conduct is impermissible under international law. It marked the beginning of the end of the age of war. Nuremberg and Rome stand against this resignation of humankind to its self-debasement and its self-destruction. The achievements of that great trial and historic conference in elevating justice over inhumanity and war give promise for a better tomorrow. We may enter the atomic age determined that tyranny shall not extend its way, nor war become its game, placing our faith in the cause of justice, in the freedom of man, and in the mercy of God. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus wrote, War is father, king of all, and some he made gods, and some men, some slaves, and some free. But David sang, the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Let there be peace in the hearts of men, and assuredly uh, there will be an end to wars among nations. Thank you. Whitney, she wants a hug. Give her a hug. Is Cindy had her picture taken? Cindy? Did Cindy have her picture taken?